This episode of Lawyers Tell All is brought to you by the Intake Academy. Are you ready to convert more callers to qualified cases, rapidly qualify good cases, and transform unqualified prospects to advocates for your firm, whether you're able to handle their case or not? Visit www.intakeacademy.com and discover how to cement relationships with more of your ideal clients. Get them to commit to you and send you more referrals than you ever thought possible. Welcome to the Lawyers Tell All podcast, where Chris Mullins, the preeminent sales and communications consultant in the legal industry, shows you how it looks through lawyers' eyes. Here, innovators in the trenches provide powerful insights that help you connect with new clients, handle the sometimes harsh realities of the legal profession, and embrace the mindsets needed to succeed. Be sure to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com. And while you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, lean in, tune in, and let's take a deep dive. everyone, it's Chris Mullins with Lawyers Tell All and the Expert Interview Series with my good friend, Harlan Schillinger, and he is an expert in the legal industry. I don't know, something like 140 law firms he's worked with, but I'm going to let Harlan tell you a little bit about himself. Go ahead, Harlan. Uh, well, first of all, every day that I wake up, my wife turns to me, my dear Patty, and says, be interesting, not interested. No, no. Uh, what does she say? She says, no, uh, be interested, not interesting. And so that <laughs> kind of puts that kind of puts me on the spot about talking about myself. Mm-hmm. But I've been in the legal space uh, since 1977. Um, people think that I started legal advertising. Perhaps I was the first one to ever do it and develop uh, a program and opportunities for other lawyers. Amazing. And I just want you to know, Harlan, that in 1979, I graduated from high school. <laughs> okay, so now you know I'm an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I, I just thought I would throw that in. <laughs> okay, well, um, so and everybody, if you see me looking away, it's because I'm looking at my my notes and some amazing questions that Harlan provided for me and we may or may not use. So the first thing that I kind of want to ask is, with regards to law firms, why do you why do you think that holding team members, all team members actually, accountable is so challenging? Well, I think you get pushback. People don't want to be accountable. Uh, lawyers are uh, not as accountable as we would think. And, uh, you know, who wants to answer to someone? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, I think we see that in our gener- the generations that are coming up. But accountability is really important. But truthfully, if you want to prosper in life, you've got to keep track. And that's accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't keep writing checks out of your checkbook because you have checks. Uh, And when it comes to uh, your business, you know, the intake and conversion aspect of it, you know, you discovered some time ago, we we know each other for many years. uh, You've taught me a lot. And, uh, you know, you taught me to be accountable, but you also taught me compassion. Mm-hmm. Okay, so compassion, empathy, that whole thing right there. My belief system is that if, as long as the leaders of a law firm, whether it's the managing partner, CEOs, middle managers, it doesn't really matter, but as long as the leaders are providing empathy to their team, the team is going to have a higher likelihood of providing empathy to clients and prospects. What do you think? Well, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it's a trickle down theory. You know, we are uh, a chip off the old block, as they say. I remember sitting in, I think we were in Maui at that wonderful yeah. hotel and and you were and I were, were, were chatting and you said something to me that must have been 10 years ago, maybe, maybe somewhere around there. You say, mm-hmm. you know, lawyers are just simply not compassionate. And we got into this compassionate uh, conversation about why and why not. You know, I think you said people will call a law firm on their worst day. Now, I'm paraphrasing because I don't have as good a memory as I used to. And people will call a law firm on their worst day, whether it's for them or for a loved one or a friend. And what they're seeking is help. 
-hmm. you know, it's it's like a, a, a drowning victim. Um, you know, how do you treat somebody that's, you know, in trouble? And law firms, and, and, and I'll really put the word 90% into this conversation, simply don't understand compassion because I believe they're just so interested in finding out, do I have a case? Is yeah. this going to make me money? Mm -hmm. And it's really about the law firm, mm -hmm. you know, from collecting data to talking about, uh, you know, uh, the process and what have you. Uh, and it's interesting. Um, the other thing that you taught me is to record telephone calls. Mm -hmm. and and do secret shopping and um, that was a great great lesson uh, I remember specifically when you suggested that I do that I remember getting off one of my first or second phone calls and I literally took a pen and I counted you know the hash marks how many times the lawyer said I I do this I do that I do this I do that right yeah and that really really affected me mm -hmm. uh, you were a tremendous influence in my thinking. Mm -hmm. And those two nuggets changed a lot of my thinking. Mm -hmm. So how do you think we can change or begin to change the thinking of the attorneys intake, the leaders, how, how to bring them along to the same kind of thinking? Well, I think people change when they're in pain. Uh, you know, it's it's very hard to change somebody or them make a change unless the lawyer embraces it and quite frankly understands it. You know, the most powerful tool I believe that you can present to a lawyer is a recorded telephone call. Mm -hmm, right. It's I call it demonstrative evidence. Mm -hmm, yeah. And you know, I <laughs> you know I basically <laughs> would present that call to the lawyer, and he, oh, that's not me. Or they'll come up with every excuse. Right. And I'm in a little different stage of my career than most people, because I'm more towards the end than the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm extremely uh, passionate about intake and conversion. In fact, I think I'm hanging my reputation on it. But I don't know how to change a lawyer's culture mm -hmm. and thinking if they're not interested in changing. Yeah. Well, they don't realize what they're doing. Right. Right. So let me, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, so one is it's so I 100% agree. You listen to the call recordings and bam, there's your evidence. There it is right there. So perfect. Yes. I will also say <laughs> that there's many times that I will be playing a call recording for the managing partner that actually called me because they want help and they show up for their consultation and I play the call recording and they, you know, I mean, some literally they're throwing things, they're yelling, they're screaming, they're swearing, they're so upset, they're just shocked. And there's a good percentage of them that after that, it, it you know, the, the pain is gone. So there is well, a, they they, they, they probably weren't in pain. <laughs> you know, that's just an immature uh, reaction. Yeah, right. um, you know, it, it it it's it's a very delicate subject that we're talking about because it really involves personality. And I truly believe. Well, first of all, you know, I own the trademark. What you don't know, you don't know. Right. Yeah. But putting the ownership of that aside, what does it really mean? When I developed with my two partners, Lead Docket. You know, I was deeply entrenched in that software and I used, you know, other pieces of software. But what software will tell you is what you don't know. Right. And so when a lawyer, you know, throws a fit, um, he's what he's really thinking about is how much money he just lost. Right. But the truth of the matter is, well, first of all, I think that they're not going to people aren't going to uh, make any kind of change unless they're in pain. And I've always said this, and this may sound a little arrogant, but they're just making too much money. Yes. Lawyers count what they have and they don't recognize what they're missing. Mm -hmm. And you and I, over the years, through the, um, the, you know, the conferences that we, you and I were on panels, we've discussed this. So if you don't know what you're missing, then mm -hmm. you don't know what to fix purely an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that will dovetail into something I do want to say about opportunity in mm -hmm. such a crowded market, because this subject 
first of all, is catching on. Right. So if we had this conversation two and three years ago, you know, we were still pushing, you know, manure uphill. So it's a lot less resistance. Mm -hmm. When I sold file, uh, the lead docket to Filevine, we had 180 individual law firms. They have well over 800 now um, because people are recognizing, you know, intake and conversion. Mm -hmm. But they're not recognizing compassion. Right, right. It's crazy. Yeah, it, it is crazy. And I, I, I believe that the solution is, is pretty easy. It just, it really just comes down to application and being committed. So if the top down is committed to playing call recordings all the time for everybody and requires those team members to, you know, provide some kind of audit themselves, then when you when you hear yourself, it's it's pretty, it's it's crushing. It can be really crushing, especially if you're not doing what you think you're doing. A lot of people, attorneys and everyone, they think that they're doing great until they listen to their call. It's just natural. So that's really the secret is listening to your call, but then you, someone has to hold them accountable. Well, well, they think they're doing well because they're putting a lot of money in their pocket. Right, yeah. Right. Okay, so let's put aside the fact that they're making a lot of money. That Most of them, almost all of them are making too much money Right. You know, for what they do and how they treat people. Mm -hmm. But let's move on to what where the opportunity is. Uh, you know, quite frankly, where the opportunity is to fill in what you don't know. Mm -hmm. right. You know, if you're racing a car, you know how fast it goes. If you need, you know, more speed, you got to figure out what it doesn't have to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is a very competitive environment. You know that it's never been more competitive, Chris. You know, in the in the history of legal. I mean, mm -hmm. you can't not watch television or internet or whatever and see lawyers advertising. Mm -hmm. So, if you step back and you say, "Okay, what is the competitive difference between myself and everyone else?" It's a couple of things. First of all, I want to use the word process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, you harped at this many years ago to me, and you said you have to have a process, mm -hmm. and that process includes compassion. It, comp it, it includes, you know, software. It confuse, it's, it's a pattern of how you're going to deal with the client. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I got, I'm deeply involved in the Camp Lejeune case, and I'm representing, uh, I guess, the biggest mass tort firm in the world, um, Whites and Luxembourg. And I listened to almost 200 telephone calls. Uh, primarily lead generators, because that's primarily who was advertising. Mm -hmm. And out of the almost 200 telephone calls, Chris, I didn't hear one person, truth, mm -hmm. say, how do you feel? Well, thank you for your service. Yeah. That was a, it was disgusting. Mm -hmm. it, I flipped out over it. In fact, mm -hmm. it really pushed me over the edge, you know, in, you know, uh, my feelings towards, um, you know, lawyers and, and uh, compassion and ambulance chasing and what have you. Um, I believe 90% of the lawyers have no compassion. And um, quite frankly, I stood up, as you know, in front of 5,000 people at Michael Mogul's meeting. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, 90% of you suck. Mm -hmm. And here's why. And I was introducing him and uh, Arthur Blank, um, you know, for his meeting. And uh, I had 15 minutes to do it. And it was about legacy. But the core of the matter is, and, and you've been doing this for a long time, is teaching people how to make money. Mm -hmm. And if they have enough money, then fine, go away. Right. If you're up and coming or you're seasoned or you want your business to grow, you got to do things to make it grow. Mm -hmm. And that's installing processes. Mm -hmm. Key word. So metrics. Numbers, data, yes? Yeah, it's imperative. Okay, so talk about that a little bit. Well, I mean, can you imagine, you know, running a car without a gas meter? <laughs> can you imagine doing anything without, without you know, some kind of accountability? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you run a race, you look at your time, you know, you keep score on the golf course, you, you got you to gotta keep, keep score. Unless you keep score, you don't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And that affects every single facet of your business, mm -hmm. uh, productivity, um, income, growth, 
uh, I can't imagine, you know, being having an advertising, you know, career since 1975, making any kind of intelligent decisions, you know, without data, you know, mm -hmm. without the numbers, mm -hmm. because if we do what we think we should do, we're wrong most of the time. I mean, who are we? Right. You know, yeah. we live in our, you know, our wonderful homes. We live in, we have great prospering businesses, families, mm -hmm. and, 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 and we're not in the same ball game as most of the people that call up, call our clients, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, desperately. So mm -hmm. if you don't know what's going on, you can't make intelligent decisions, but on the upside, making intelligent decisions is an incredibly powerful competitive move. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I, I believe that if you monitor your numbers and you know what your numbers are and you run your firm like a sales business and teach everybody, especially like intake for inbound and outbound calls, call centers, wh whatever you're calling your department, because it seems like it's changing quite a bit lately, just run it like it's a sales business, a sales team numbers, um, you know, scorecards on, on your, on your dashboards. And it is a sales team. It is yeah, a it sales is, number. Yeah, yeah. And just do it and just do it. Run it that way. Just, just like sales. I never thought the word salesman was a dirty word. Right. Some people feel it's condescending or they don't want to be the salesperson. Uh, but the truth is everybody's selling something. You're mm -hmm. selling yourself right. to an insurance agent, right. uh, insurance uh, adjuster. You're selling yourself to the jury. Right, exactly. In fact, my, uh, and you know this very well, my backbone is to talk to the public the way you would a jury mm -hmm. because you get what you ask for. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And some of my clients or, or, or students that are attorneys they they communicate in the courtroom much better. They use sales skills. They use um, you know sales language. They use empathy. They use compassion. They enunciate. They change their their tone and their everything. They've got their eye contact. They would never be rude or anything like that to anybody in the courtroom. And they're amazing. And then when they get their client on the phone and I listen to the calls. They're like, Mrs. Smith, stop crying over spilt milk. Well, they're actors. And I'm not saying that in a negative sense whatsoever. But when a lawyer walks into the courtroom, he has a process on how he's going to proceed. Mm -hmm, right. And, and when you answer the phone and you set up a call center or have one person or two people answering your calls, you have to have a process to stay on track. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You, you know, no matter what you look at, if you look at golf, there's a process, you know, in a tournament there, it, it, a prize fighter, there's a process. No matter what you do in life, there's a process, you know, growing children, having, you know, a family, being in a relationship, there's a process. There's a process. Right. But I want that word sales. We're mm -hmm. all selling something. Tell me one person, rhetorical question, that isn't selling something. Right. You know, it's uh, it's crazy. We're, we're, we're selling right now. We're not selling a direct, but basically, however we are right now in this interview, it's going to sell an image. Of well, quite frankly, I'll tell you exactly what I, I'm doing. Number one, I, I'm educating people. I'm showing them. I'm showing them how to make much more money. Right. And that's my reputation. Mm -hmm. I built my reputation making money for my clients. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and so did you. That's what we do. Right. But I'm also selling myself. Right. Exactly. Right. 100%. 100%. You're selling yourself all the time. No matter what your role is at the law firm, you're selling yourself as you move throughout the firm from department to department. As you have, you, you have a meeting with your team, as you hold your team accountable or you don't. When you're interviewing people to to join your firm, you're always selling yourself. You're selling yourself when people, when you think nobody's looking at you, you're selling yourself constantly all the time, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I want to inject a phrase that is called ambassador of first impressions. And you've heard me use that many time and I, times, and I'm going to use it as an analogy. analogy. So think about this. Lawyers spend 
anybody, they spend all kinds of money to get the phone to ring. Mm -hmm. They'll go over backwards. They'll jump through hoops. They'll do anything to get that phone to ring. Okay, the phone rang. Mm -hmm. Now what happens? Mm -hmm. Generally, we have the wrong person answering the phone because we haven't treated that person to the opportunity of knowing what their real job is. They're the ambassador of first impressions. Right. You know, when you make a phone call to somebody, how that phone is answered will determine where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. In a competitive environment, a, a, a victim is going to call one, two, three, four lawyers. Mm -hmm. See, lawyers got to get it out of the head that they're not important. Right. They're interchangeable. Mm -hmm. They really are. Mm -hmm. There's a thousand lawyers. You know, you don't go to a lawyer because that's the great lawyer. You got a lawyer because the problem and you want it solved. And who, who's going to solve that problem first is going to win. Mm -hmm. And how you treat that person. And we've all, I mean, look, we've all had problems with our credit cards. We've all had problems with, you know, whatever it is, then we have to go to customer service. How many times, and ask yourself, I want the, the audience to ask themselves, how do they feel after they got off a shitty call? Right. And how many times have they had a shitty call? Mm -hmm. I just got, I just, 10 minutes ago, I ordered uh, a new system, uh, Simply Safe, for a new house. Mm -hmm. I decided I'm not going to go to ADT or, you know, well, you're going to do it. And I have to tell you, I was so impressed with the salesman that I talked to. Yeah. I, I can't wait to write a review. Mm -hmm. I was so, it was so refreshing. This is the truth. So help me. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and I think it was yesterday or the day before I get, I have a problem with something and I get on the phone and I have no problem talking to people overseas, right. but I do have a problem when people can hear me, they have a bad reception. Mm -hmm. I cannot understand them. And, and I'm just frustrated. All I want to do is get off the telephone. Mm -hmm. I am such a believer in the Ritz Carlton, uh, way of doing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. So Ritz Carlton all the way from the, from the top of the call to the end of the call, Zoom, it doesn't really matter what it is, but about the overseas, I a hundred percent think it's, I support uh, virtual intake teams. You know, I support the whole over a hundred percent. And I think it's very important. I think that's where we're going and that's okay. But I agree with you when, and I just had this the other day myself, um, I think it was calling the phone company and the person that I'm speaking to, I can't understand them. And, and like you said, the, the, the sound technology, it's not good. And so it frustrates me, but the big thing too, is it, what I start thinking about the company because of that is terrible. It's not so much the person that I'm speaking to. It's like the company that made the decision that that's what they're going to do. They're not going to care. And that makes me, that makes me not be happy with the company. That makes me think negative about the company. That makes me not trust everything else with my relationship with that company because of that one moment. On the other side, if you receive a conversation or you're involved in a conversation and, and they're empathetic, simply paying attention to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll go back to that uh, wake up call that I get every morning, you know, to be interested, not interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you feel like, oh, my, 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 my God, I, I, I think I have a friend on the phone. Um, you got to understand the nature of the beast. Stop making money. Money will come to you. Believe me. You know, yeah. if you just simply read the oath of office that a lawyer took when mm -hmm. he became a lawyer. It's one paragraph. Every state has it. I will do this. I will do this. I also have never met a lawyer in all of my life that read that after they signed it. Right. Yeah. When I take a client on, they have to reread it, re-sign it, and I have to be able to record their telephone calls. And they have to have a, 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 a software system in place. Those mm -hmm. are my three uh, criteria to do business and I don't deviate from it. Well, that's, that's important that your criteria, but mostly that you don't deviate from it because now you're, you're teaching them accountability at the same time. But let me ask you, let me go back to processes because I agree with you and you've said it a few times, but what about some examples of what you mean when you say processes? 
A process is, uh, most people are familiar with a process where they have, uh, you know, a, um, what do you call it? A, a, you know, a sheet to read it, things off the questions and so on, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, an outline. Mm -hmm. And the outline should be followed. The very first thing on that outline is how do you feel? Mm -hmm. If somebody goes back to the a lawyer, goes back to their office and they take a look at the intake sheet and it's, you know, uh, go to lead docket or go to Captora, go to any of the, you know, mm -hmm. the systems mm -hmm. and if it's not on there, put it on there. But the process is I'm going to go through this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. But you also have to have built into your process the ability to listen mm -hmm. and to ask. And the process, you know, is the direction, is the game plan that you follow from the beginning of the call to the end. Right. Now, you can't be that rigid. Mm -hmm. or too rigid not to deviate from it. Right. Yeah. You know what the process in Ritz Carlton is? Somebody comes up to the front desk, they check in or they have a complaint. Their process, the very first thing is the person that is listening to that behind the desk is empowered to be able to solve their problem. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that that person can completely solve that problem, but mm -hmm. they're empowered to call somebody. But at the end of the day, their process says, if I begin a conversation with somebody, I'm going to end it by asking them, is your situation resolved? Mm -hmm. Pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. You know, they have that at the Four Seasons, all the better, you know, a lot of better hotels. Um, well, I'm not going to label it to just better hotels. It's just good business. It's good business. And there's plenty of businesses that do it. And I, I think the, the smartest thing for law firms would be is to stop trying to learn from other law firms, stop trying to copy other law firms, learn from the other amazing businesses that are out there. You'll right. get we've, we've said that many times to each other. Yeah, you'll get, you'll get better ideas and better solutions. But the other thing too is back to the processes. And I, I think you might've been talking about the intake screening questions to ask to qualify the prospect. When you were talking about the um, the questions, so just do exactly what Harlan said. Have have the questions. Just a lot of firms still don't even have the questions formed. They just throw people on the phone. Have the questions that you need to qualify this prospect. Put it in your your CRM system, and then just include in there however you can do it. Um, reminders about empathy. Reminders about active listening. Remind us about a little bit of, you know, sales language. Just put them in there because that will, that will, that will help your team. That's it. That's if you just did that and listen to your calls, just that. Wow. Well, let me, let me give you one other, let me give our audience one other tip that I'm uh, very adamant about. Mm -hmm. You know, you go through the process and you come down to the line, you know, or give me your email, give me your telephone number. Yeah. You know, at that point, the intake person assumes that's how that person wants to be communicated because they gave me their email. Mm -hmm. That's not true. Mm -hmm. Not in today's society, mm -hmm. depending on the age, depending on the location, depending on who you're talking to. I insist that my clients and my friends put in, how, Chris, would you like me to communicate with you? Mm -hmm. You. Would you prefer that I text you? Would you prefer that I reach you at seven o'clock at night? Right. Tell me all the things that I need to do to right. service you. Help me help you. Right. I have rarely ever come across. In fact, I don't think I've ever come across uh, a process that included that one question. Mm -hmm. uh, I stumbled into it a couple of years ago uh, when I really started, started to look at, you know, some clients, you know, into, I sat in there and, and uh, I came back and, they couldn't reach people. Right. Well, they couldn't reach people because they're calling them back at the end of the day after they've called the people, you know, the easy ones. Mm -hmm. You know, the chase is always so difficult. Mm -hmm. And they calling, I remember this intake person kept calling this person at two o'clock in the afternoon at their work. Well, that person is not going to answer that personal phone call at work or well, mm -hmm. whatever it was. Mm -hmm. They didn't take the time to say, you know, how can I speak with you? Right. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's being interested. Right. A hundred, hundred percent. And then the other thing too, is that that's an example of calling prospects, clients, 
what have you, when it's good for you, the best time for you, you're not doing it the best time for them. And then, and then also pay attention to the details, like the numbers, analyze it. And okay, if I keep calling Mrs. Smith every Monday at two and I'm not getting her, maybe I should try if, if I don't know yet what her request is, because I didn't ask her, maybe I should try Tuesday at nine o'clock in the morning. You know, just pay attention to what it is that you're, what you're doing, right? Well, if you really want to try to reach somebody, you know, have your, your intake staggered hours and, and reach them, um, you know, you know, one of the greatest moves a lawyer can make is call somebody back at six, seven o'clock, call them back right in the middle of dinner. You'll, you'll, the re, the response will, oh boy, I've never had a lawyer call me back, let alone call me back in the middle I, of dinner. I, yeah. So, so, so that, you know, that, it, but, you know, I'll go back to a, to a, to a book that uh, everybody should read. Uh, and it's, and, and I think one of the chapters is, uh, or the verses is, do unto others as others do unto you. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of the Ten Commandments, or mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the scrolls. But the point of it is, is, is you know, we're all so anxious to know: Do I have a deal? Is this mm -hmm. a case I want? Yeah. So if you if I, you got a hundred phone calls and you take twenty cases, you just put eighty people out on the street mm -hmm. saying negative things about you. Mm -hmm. Those 80 people multiply 20 times. You can do the math. That's a fact. Right. That's, what's go, that's what goes on. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at your business, you know, you really got to sit down and you got to put yourself in the client's shoes. And that's kind of what that lawyer did when he went to court mm -hmm. talking to the jury. Mm -hmm. But then they forget. And then we say, well, you know, business wasn't taught in law school or doctors don't have bedside manners, but that's all bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is business. What's your most competitive edge? I suggest that your clients sit back, stare out the window. And I learned that from Harvey McKay, by the way, you know, the envelope yeah. guy from Chicago. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he would say, take 20 minutes a week or take 10 minutes a day and stare out the window. Well, you're not going to just stare out the window. You're going to think of something. But think about that call and how they need to be treated. If you're a shitty lawyer, shitty person, shitty person is a shitty lawyer, mm -hmm. you're going to dismiss that person because he's not any good to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not cool. No, it's, it's First not, of all, it's not good marketing. It's not good marketing, but also like it, you want to start by just thinking about yourself, like, like you said, if you're a shitty person, you're going to be a shitty attorney. But the other thing too is that you gotta you gotta remember to humanize the relationships. If you want to have a good relationship with a client, if you want the client to more times than not trust you and do what you say, and 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 you know support your decisions, then you've got to be good to them. You've got to take care of them. You've got to keep your promises. You got to call back when you say you're going to call back. If you don't. They're going to treat you the same way. And even if they don't fire you, they're still not going to be happy and they'll still give you poor reviews. And, and the other thing I want to say before I forget, Harlan, is I believe uh, intake departments, sales departments, whatever the label we're going to put on them, should be 24-7 and totally about sales and experience and all of that and stop. We're still doing it. This is 2023 and we're still not hiring enough people. We're not teaching them how to sell. We're not teaching them experience. We're not, we're not, we're, we're still trying to figure out how do we get calls answered after hours? We'll just hire, hire people to work after hours. Well, how do we get people to take, oh, we can't get people to convert in the weekend. We'll hire people to work on the weekend, <laughs> right? You know, it's just so, it's so, um, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. I was going to say disgusting, but people, they just don't think about it. They don't think about it. And I, and I think they're just making too much money. What well, you can't tell me that they're not smart. You know, it's really hard to become a lawyer. You know, it's hard to, you know, to get into law school. It's hard to get through law school. You know, it's hard to pass the bar. Mm -hmm. You know, only 50, what, 2% pass the bar on the second yeah. time mm -hmm. through, second time through. Mm -hmm. So you can't say, me, say to me they're not smart. People are not smart. What they, what they are is they're not compassionate. And compassion isn't only asking, you know, what, you know, how do you feel, you know, to the victim, right. but yeah. it's dealing with every facet of that business. You know, Jeff Bezos said it well, character is uh, doing the right thing when nobody's in the room. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, back to processing, 
I do believe that Jeff Bezos deserves to be the second wealthiest man in the world. Mm -hmm. Because he had he developed a process that makes it so seamless to do business with Amazon. It's pathetic. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I remember and, when he first started. I remember when he first started, I was like, what, what's going to happen with Amazon, right? Yeah. What's going to what's happen gonna, with all the bookstores? <laughs> look, at it, look at it now. Look at it now. Here, here's the, the word that I think um, is a, a problem, too, is entitlement. I think it's just a strong sense of entitlement. Oh, the phone rings, it'll keep ringing. Oh, I have a client to take care of, I'll keep having clients. It's, we're not grateful for the career that we're in, the, the, the law you just opened, you opened You just opened up an entire I know. Uh, can of worms. And that is, we can spend hours talking I know. about that. You know, we got generations that are coming up that, you know, are entitled. I, know, uh, yeah. I don't want to get into the political aspect of it, mm. uh, but we, it's, it's, it's pathetic. It's really pathetic. Let's let's and before we leave, I really want to suggest some very concrete things that people can do to when they get off the phone to make more money. Go for it. OK, well, the first thing is sit back and look at what how you're doing things now. Mm -hmm. Have somebody evaluate what you're doing. Have a third party come in and, and take a good, hard look at what your processes are. You know, they always say two eyes, four eyes, mm -hmm. six eyes are always better. Mm -hmm. I really believe that. You know, as smart as I think I am sometimes or people think I am, I always bring in somebody else to see what I don't see. Right, yeah. Go through the process. Mm -hmm. The very first thing you do when you get off this phone is start secret shopping your law firm. Mm -hmm. Record your calls. Mm -hmm. If you don't do that, First of all, you're going to come up with a million excuses. Well, I can't do this, and the bars can't do this, and I can't do that. That is all BS. Mm -hmm. If you can't record your telephone calls, you are never going to know what's really going on. And uh, the second thing is make sure that you absolutely have accountability software. I don't care if you're a two-person firm or a 10-person firm or a thousand-person firm, you've got to have some kind of accountability process in place. You got to have a piece of software. And I'm not talking about a case management system. No. I'm talking about a CRM, right, customer give, relations management tool. Right. But give just like, I, I know what you're saying, but give a little specific example when, because you said accountability software, which is great, but like, for example, what, what would an example be? The cheapest piece of software that you can put in I'm talking to the cheapies on the on the call. Mm -hmm. Is CallRail? Oh yeah. CallRail Call Rail will tell you what is going on with each and every telephone call that you have. Now it's not a true CRM because it doesn't help you chase the caller. Right. Yeah. That's a whole nother conversation. It's a whole process, but at least it will tell you what is going on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very simple. You know, how many times has somebody taken a look at their analytics on their website? You know right. what one of the biggest shocks people get when they have a meeting with, with their account, with their with their uh, digital agency, and digital agencies are at fault for this. Mm -hmm. Okay, they don't look at all the digital leads that come in. Right. And the and the agency doesn't say at the end of the week, "This is what I generated. Tell me what you generated." Right. I mean, think about that. Okay, well, I don't want to offend him. I don't want to upset the client. No, you're setting yourself up to get fired. Mm -hmm. You know, as an agency, because you haven't done your job. Well, yes, I did. Look at all the business that I gave to him. Well, mm -hmm. that person doesn't know what business you gave him because right. it's falling through the cracks. And all they're doing is finding fault on you. Right. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest, number one, you have to, uh, that's number two, you have to really have, uh, accountability in place. And if you think you don't, and you think you have it now, you don't. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you don't. And call rail, actually, everybody is, is probably the easiest, quickest switch to flip to get accountability, honestly. I mean, it the very, really, really the next is. call that, The next call that you make after you get off the phone with you, well, so it should be to you to hire you so you can help them. But after they make, <laughs> after they make that call, you call your digital agency and you say, do I have call rail? Mm -hmm. And if the agency says, yes, you say, let's use it. And if the agency says, no, we're not hooked up, fire them. Mm 
Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would also uh, say to the agency, in addition to that, that you want them to provide you with uh, daily, a daily report of leads that they generated for you. So, I mean, even well, if that's where that's where I was going with this. Yeah, yeah. So just do jump, that too. Do that too. No, you, no, you have to. That's why you're doing all of this, and you send that, and you say, "Tell me what happened with these five accounts." Right. Well, we got this one going on, or we're chasing this one, or I don't know. I want you to see what you're doing is you're taking money and you're throwing it down the drain. Mm hmm. Yeah. The other thing too is agencies, you should have like a criteria of the perfect client for you because you don't want to have law firms that are clients that are not holding their team accountable, that don't focus on sales, that are not focused on conversion because it's all, it's all extra work for you and you're not going to, you're not going to be able to help them. So eventually you'll be fired anyway. So when you're looking uh, when you're looking at this process and you're looking at the accountability aspect, mm -hmm. there are several numbers that I focus on. Number okay. one, I have never met a lawyer that has ever walked into their office. And I really mean this and say, how many calls did I get today? Mm -hmm. Everyone walks in. How many cases did I get? OK, the second thing that nobody asks is how many calls cases did I not get today? So in your metrics, I mean, it's not that complicated. I insist on having. Give me all the calls that came in. Mm -hmm. So I want to know where my advertising dollars are going. If I'm getting 50 case calls, I want to know the wanted cases. Mm -hmm. And I want to know my wanted conversion. Mm -hmm. Your wanted conversion means you converted. I never use intake without conversion. Right. Intake is great, but it's conversion. Mm -hmm. And you never want to, you know, you want to look at this and say, how many cases did I convert from my wanted? Now, a good CRM will break it down. You don't know mm -hmm. exactly. And you'll also know the efficiency of your people. Mm -hmm. Right. And why yeah. is, you know, one person, you know, signing three times the amount of cases mm -hmm. than this person and they're getting the same amount of calls. That's accountability. Mm hmm. And so those are the three metrics that I uh, I live by. The, I'm just giving the simple version. Those yeah. are the three, the three, uh, the three. Well, that's where I start. My conversion, I aim for ninety two percent of wanted cases. And and just to kind of clarify for everybody, uh, so it's the number of calls you got, you know, in the day, and then out of those calls, how many of those calls were wanted. Which, you will call them wanted. So leads that we we can help, people that we can help. Like if we if we do PI and it's a criminal, we can't help the criminal. So it's the ones that we can help. And then out of the wanted, how many converted? And then whatever's left, what happened to them? Where are they? Correct. Right. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. You know, somebody will say, well, it was a real estate call or somebody had a bankruptcy or somebody had this. Well, what are you doing with all those? You need to monetize all those. You're paying, you know, you're paying somewhere around, you know, $100 to $250 to say no to somebody, mm -hmm, you right. know, just to hang up on them. First of all, you got to capture all those and put them into a database. Yep. I'm adamant about that. You paid to get them to call you. Right. Yeah. We could go. You know, I love, I love, right? I love the lawyer that says, you know, I, 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 well, I, let me, let me go back. I was, I, I, I was at a conference and I was actually at the same conference you are. And I remember being outside, it was in Jackson, Wyoming years ago. And we were outside the, uh, the conference room and the client was looking for 20 cases. You know, he was shy 20 cases a month. And I looked at the grid and the account, the manager, the account, advertising manager was so proud that he had this grid and he had all the data and everything. And uh, I turned and I said, well, what about that client? Oh, well, that was a no-show. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. So 20 no-shows later, I, I said, what about the no-shows? Why didn't they show? Oh, we don't know. Yeah. Well, we didn't want those cases. What do you mean you didn't want those cases? You said you wanted the case. You made the appointment. The client didn't show up and you didn't do anything about it. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Or you didn't ensure that they were going to show up or you didn't try to sell them on the call. Whatever it was, you missed the case. Mm-hmm. And that happens all the time. I mean, we yeah. could go on, you and I can go on for days on this conversation. I know, I know. 
it's and like I said, everybody, I mean, wow, it's still happening. Okay, so I'm just gonna we're about to leave now, but I just want to ask you a quick question. What what why do you think it is that all of a sudden intake has become important? So here's what I mean by it. All of a sudden, we firms didn't pay attention to answering services and call centers, whatever you want to call them. They, they didn't pay attention. Well, now we have attorneys that have started their own call centers, like a lot. And then they we never had a hiring process for intake, but now we have attorneys that have started their own virtual hiring practices to place people virtually. And then and then the other thing too is we have we have attorneys that are kind of like getting more and more and more into software. I mean, I'm not saying it never happened, but not. Well, like the first, the first, my opinion on that, um, and you know, look, I'm at a different stage than most people, so I'll say almost anything. If if I believe it, I'll say it. First of all, I am not, I am not fond, or I don't, I, I can't figure out why lawyers start separate businesses when their own business is suffering. <laughs> okay, that's that's one thing. And yeah. I'm being very light in that. I'm just going to touch on it. Oh, okay. But I know more consultants that are consultants and they don't do what they're telling their clients to do. And I'll just leave it at that. So you can take, you can pretty much figure out where I was headed with yes, that. Yes, I do. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I you know, feel about that. But the reason that people are starting to pay attention to it is right. because they feel the pain. It's a very, very competitive world. And it's never been more competitive in, in legal. You cannot. Uh, you know, it, it, people, there's always room for another player. And uh -huh. you, no matter where you go in what city, you're bombarded by lawyers advertising. So what's your competitive advantage? I personally think that your competitive advantage is intake and how you treat people and converting cases. I, I'm going to give two other tidbits. My second most competitive thing, and this is how I go about it. There aren't any lawyers, big volume lawyers that are hypothetically, you got a lawyer out of Orlando, hypothetically, mm -hmm. um, and, and they take in hypothetically 200 cases. They're spending more money to keep those 200 cases. So what's the logical way to be competitive? Number one, how about we try to attract better cases? Right. It costs the same to bring in a small case than a big case. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you get what you ask for. That's a whole nother conversation. Right. Yeah. The second thing is, the most important way to do it is work your cases yes, and get more value out of your cases. So at the end of the day, lawyers are saying, well, I got to get more cases. I got to get more cases. Well, how about we get more money and get less cases? Mm -hmm. That's more profitable. Mm -hmm. Work the cases. A hundred percent. You know, 90% of lawyers sell their clients short. <laughs> yeah, I do. No, seriously, that's yeah, a really no, serious do. problem. Yeah, I okay? do. Those are sucky lawyers. They are. And I guarantee you, there's people on this call who are listening to this. They're going to say, oh, that's not me. Hmm. Okay, you got, you know, you, and, and we can get into the, the whole negotiation, the whole settlement value. You know, how many lawyers get on the phone and they say, ask the insurance company how much the case is worth? Mm -hmm. And they go to Colossus and say, well, you know, you lost a finger. It's only 2500 Okay, well, let's negotiate that. Yeah. What are you kidding me? It, it, That's a shitty lawyer. It, and only 90% yeah. of them are that way. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Well, I, I, will, I will tell everybody that we, we don't just listen to intake calls. We listen to attorney calls too, client attorney calls. And so everything that Harlan's saying, he's putting it very mildly. So listen to your calls. Okay, Harlan, what are the last words that you want to say to everybody? Um, you've got to really pay attention to this. It, 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 being competitive, uh, you know, when we started this thing uh, in 1977, no matter what we did, you know, until through the 80s and mid 90s and actually mid 2000s, you, you couldn't get out of the way of business. It doesn't work that way anymore. You got to find out what's the most competitive. What? How do you be competitive? And if you take a look at the greatest athletes, Mm -hmm, yeah. They are the first one on the field and the last one off the field. Mm -hmm. you know, their work ethic is un unbelievable. Mm -hmm. They uh, a, a, There is an, a golfer or a, a, an athlete that 
doesn't record the emotions so that they can go back and take a look at it. That's where the accountability comes in. That's where the, you know, the software and everything comes in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But sit back and say, okay, what kind of a person am I? And what kind of a person do I want to be? And what, how do I want, you know, my, my reputation to be? What is my character? Mm -hmm. And the most important thing I'm going to tell the audience right now, the most important thing for a lawyer is credibility. When you're in a courtroom and you talk to the public and you talk to the jury, you've got to be credible. Mm -hmm. When you're on the phone and you answer the phone on an intake call, credibility will win. If you want to negotiate with an insurance company, your credibility will get you the amount you need. Mm -hmm. So credibility has to permeate through every facet of your business and especially intake because that is your first and almost only shot at the client. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. Go to the front desk, hand your receptionist a bonus mm -hmm. and then hand a, a new card saying, I'm the ambassador of first impressions. I'm mm -hmm. the first person people are gonna speak to in this firm. And what I say and do is gonna dictate you miss the lawyer and mm -hmm. treat it that way, understand it. Mm -hmm. 100%. All right, Harlan, thank you so much. I appreciate your time very much. My pleasure. It's been great. You know, Chris, I, I just want to say I've learned so much from you over the years. We have different styles in doing things, and that's okay. Um, that's how you learn. Uh, there's a lot of things that you taught me. I remember when we wrote that book together. Yes. I, you are very smart at what you do. And people should listen. And I know that sounds, you know, like I'm building you up. I am for a reason. I was anxious to be on this podcast because we're, we, we have similar ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that 100%. And I was anxious to have you because I know that everybody can learn from you and you are a great resource, right? So Thank what, you. If I, what if I called you, I hope this is okay, but what if I said you're the grandfather of... Oh, legal. <laughs> oh, no, no. He's blushing. Everybody. <laughs> oh. You know, you know, that was, I was called on that, you know, a number of years ago and, you know, people just kept saying it and it's in my bio. I'm considered the grandfather of legal oh, okay. advertising <laughs> because, because I was the, I was the first person to organize and, and implement legal advertising back in 1977. I shot my first commercials in 78, 79, and we went on air and we built this industry. Um, I mean, I got a lot of gray hairs from it. What can I say? I'm very proud of that. You know, when we started, I'm also very proud as being the grandfather, I guess. We started the National Trial Lawyers Advertising Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the Golden Gavel Awards, which is like the Emmys for, or Gra Grammys for advertising. You know, we're legitimizing, you know, my passion is legitimizing lawyer advertising. Everybody advertises, mm -hmm. even the ones that say I don't. Right, yeah, mm-hmm. And so I guess I just have that passion. And I guess because I have so many gray hairs now. You've always had gray hair. Grand... No, no, no. <laughs> I've known you for a long time. You, you've always had gray hair. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, what can I say? Yeah, well, I, I appreciate your time today. I know everybody else does too. So thank you so much. If I can be of any help to anybody, you can, you can reach me at uh, Harlan Schillinger. Uh, dot com or Harlan Schilling or Gmail. Um, I don't necessarily chase business, uh, but I will give a helping hand to anyone in need. Yeah, I appreciate that so much. And Harlan will. All right, everyone. So long. Thank you once again. Lawyers Tell All and the Expert Interview Series. So long, everybody. Bye-bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to Lawyers Tell All where Chris Mullins takes you on a journey with lawyers in the trenches who show you the realities of what it takes to succeed in this chaotic, crowded, ever-changing profession. Remember to visit our website at www.lawyerstellall.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on Lawyers Tell All. Thank you.